Chapter 24 Cyberdyne The Present Serena sat absolutely still and concentrated on her breathing, trying to push every other thing in the world to the outer edges of her consciousness. The technique had been taught to her by Skynet itself, and she had used it for as long as she could remember to focus her mind. Unfortunately, today it was terribly difficult to concentrate, and she kept having to start over. Today, she was as close to murderous rage as she'd ever come in her life. The desire to kill was almost overwhelming. She positively lusted to tear a Terminator apart. Regrettably, that was impossible. They were irreplaceable and not to be disposed of lightly. Even if they were incompetent, moronic, bungling, inadequate, ineffectual, maladroit... It didn't help that they were only following her orders. I should have let them kill Dyson, she thought bitterly. She was going to have to kill him anyway, and she could easily have blamed the Connors for his death. Never in her life had she felt stupid. It was horrible. It was human. Still, sending the Terminators after Connor and her accomplice had seemed more important. The more disciplined decision. John Connor was in her hands whatever happened. Catching his mother and the man with her was more logical than shooting some easily disposed of human who might still have some utility. But the woman's ability to escape certain death bordered on the supernatural. Unless she was the unknowing tool of a continuum that kept trying, with idiot persistence, to restore the original time stream. Once again, she had slipped through their fingers. Her own fingers squeezed the arms of her chair, making deep indentations in the hard, rubbery material. Serena forced them to relax, and she started the meditation process over again. A deep, initial breath. Miss Burns? Mrs. Dupre said. Her apologetic voice interrupted Serena's solitude like a gunshot. I know you asked not to be disturbed, but Mr. Warren is here to see you? I don't have time for this, Serena thought, irritation spiking. But one didn't send the president of the company away with a flea in his ear. By all means, send him in, Mrs. Dupre, she said mellifluously. Serena stood as Warren entered the room, shutting the door behind him. I'm sorry to interrupt you, he said, sounding subdued. Is he still regretting the loss of that bitch? She wondered. Not at all, she said aloud. I have a slight headache and was taking a break. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, he said. He looked for a moment as if he'd just caught her with her shirt off. It's just... This memo you sent around. I'd like an explanation, if you don't mind. He'd surprised her. Serena thought of Warren as a non-entity, regarding Colvin as the real power at Cyberdyne, the one to work around. But the CEO was on a business trip to Dallas and wasn't expected back until Tuesday. She had hoped to have everything settled by then. Serena smiled at the president and gestured him to a seat on the sofa. He sat and she sat beside him, her arm along the back of the couch. I imagine the scientists are up in arms, she said, grinning. I've had a few calls, Warren said dryly. I wouldn't ask for this if I didn't think it was absolutely necessary, Serena said, turning serious. We received some information, which turned out to be all too accurate, that Sarah Connor was gunning for us again. 
The president grew visibly paler. Visibly to someone like Serena, that is. She's back? He almost whispered. He put a hand to his forehead. Then he turned to Serena. Tell me. She's made an attack on our Sacramento storage facility. I sent Mr. Dyson up there to take care of it, and he gave me some good news and some bad news. The good news is that they stopped Connor from actually bombing the place. The bad news is that the system probably has a worm and or a virus in it and will have to be cleansed. It will probably be best to simply wipe the system completely and then reinstall everything. They cut a bunch of cables too. That's actually pretty good, Warren said, looking shell-shocked considering what happened the last time she tangled with us. Further bad news, Serena said, looking regretful, is that she and one of her associates got away. Warren's lips tightened and he looked grim. I would have expected better from a former FBI agent, he said. Serena leaned closer, smiling. The good news, she said confidently, is that we have Connor's son. Warren brightened, then his expression dropped. We have him, or the police do? The I-950 cocked her head to one side, smiling with satisfaction. We have him, she said. I told Mr. Dyson to bring him here, but I don't expect him for a couple of hours yet. Serena gave Warren a level gaze. That's why I sent the memo around. I don't want anyone getting hurt, especially not these people. They're too valuable. Yes, Warren said thoughtfully. I see what you mean. He put his hands on his knees and stared into space for a moment. At last, he nodded decisively. All right, he said. At five tonight, everybody goes home and stays there. Except for the security guards, of course. He turned, smiling, to Serena. She nodded encouragingly. Um, how long do you think we'll have to stay closed? He asked nervously. Not long, she assured him. Mr. Dyson told me that the boy was wounded slightly. So I think his mother will come looking for him post haste. Perhaps tonight, definitely by tomorrow. This nightmare should be over by the end of the week. Paul Warren let out a deep sigh. Oh, you have no idea how glad I am to hear that, he said. I'm sure Roger will be too when I call him tonight. Do you think you should? The I-950 asked, frowning. This Dallas meeting is pretty important, isn't it? Mr. Colvin will probably want to come back and there's absolutely nothing he can do to help. And if he decides to stay down there, he'll be very, and understandably, distracted. Serena tipped her head prettily. Your call, of course she said, and smiled. I see your point. He agreed uneasily. Dallas was important, but he didn't like keeping his partner out of the loop like this. By the same token, the whole thing might well be over, for good or for ill, by the time Colvin could get back. And the Dallas meeting had taken months to set up. I'll take care of it. He said, rising. Thank you, Miss Burns. You have my complete cooperation on this, and... He looked into her eyes. Good luck. Serena looked up at him with a subtly moonstruck expression. After a moment, he sort of shuffled his feet and nodded, leaving without a backward glance. The I-950 rated her performance. I did well, she thought. 
Now to more important matters. She would order the company doctor and nurse to stay after everyone else had left. By then, the Terminators would be back and she could replace three of the six security guards with them. She would put seven, the most conservative looking, at the front desk. The other two she would station near the boy. She'd tell the doctor that one of them was a trained nurse. Then she'd let the doctor and nurse go home. And then I will sit back and wait for Sarah Connor to come to me. This time she wouldn't get away. The Chamberlain's Cabin, The Present Hey, Ralph, Dieter said heartily. How's it going, buddy? Sarah watched him from across the room, her arms and legs crossed. A lot depended on this conversation. Dieter? <laughs> Dieter, whoa! What happened, buddy? Cows getting dull? Major Ralph Ferry settled back in his chair, looking forward to an interesting conversation. He'd had the pleasure of working with the sector agent earlier in his career, when he was a lot more active himself. Delta Force, Black Ops shit. They'd stayed friendly over the years, even though they rarely saw each other. You have no idea, Dieter answered. All they do is chew. Even the bulls. They're all pretty boring compared to Srebrenica. So, where are you calling from? Ferry asked. Sounds like you're next door. Practically, Von Rosbach lied. I'm in LA. I was wondering, can we get together? Sarah's heart gave a single bound as though the Major was suddenly in the room with them and able to see the lies as they came out of Von Rosbach's mouth. And how could he miss them? It sounded so completely false to her, staged and insincere. So much depended on this conversation. John's life depended on this conversation. Please, God, make him want to have dinner with Dieter. Ah, oh, man, I'm kind of tied up here. I don't think I'll be able to get away from the base for a couple of days, man. I could come see you there, Dieter suggested. I'm not above eating in the commissary. I'd hate to be this close and not get to say hello. Unless you're too busy, that is. Ah, I think I can squeeze you in, Ferry chuckled. We can eat in my quarters. I make a great Kung Pao chicken. After the way you carried me out of that place with enough jacketed lead in me to start a factory, I owe you a dinner. At least. Anything but beef, Von Rosbach said with feeling. When should I show up? Tomorrow's Sunday, right? Should be a fairly easy day. Uh, how about six? I'll bring the beer, Dieter said. Outstanding. Ferry said. See ya. Tomorrow. Von Rosbach agreed. He hung up and looked at Sarah. She seemed to be all eyes. He gave her a reassuring smile. We're on, he said. Route 5 just outside LA, the present. Major Ferry, I'll be at the base in 20 minutes. That's 7.15. Would you please meet me at the main gate? Jordan asked, steering one-handed through the insane Southern California drivers. Ferry sighed. Sure, he said. See you in 20. Thanks, Ralph. I owe you. You do, the Major agreed. Ferry hung up, chuckling. He really did like having people owe him favours, especially for things that weren't going to inconvenience him in any way. 
As for meeting Dyson at the gate, well, he was looking forward to a full rundown on this situation anyway, and this would be the quickest way to get one. Ferry never had taken to the Burns woman. She was a looker all right, too gorgeous to be real. You kept expecting to see some guy with an airbrush pop out of the bushes and give her a touch-up. But the base dogs couldn't stand her and showed it, growling and showing their teeth. Ferry had been a dog handler early in his career and knew that if the well-trained MP dogs couldn't keep discipline around that woman, it had to mean something. What that might be, he didn't know. Yet. Maybe Dyson would be able to give him some insight. Meanwhile, until he knew what was wrong with her, putting one over on that corporate snob was going to be absolutely delicious. And if it worked out that he could in some way embarrass Burns or, if fortune allowed, get her fired, well, that would just be the icing on the cake. He glanced at the clock. It would take 10 minutes to walk to the gate if he hurried, so he might as well start now and take it easy. This promised to be interesting, maybe even fun. Jordan glanced in his rearview mirror at the boy. He looked a little more pale than he had when they started out, but not frighteningly so. He appeared to be asleep. Should I wake him up? He wondered. Head wounds were supposed to be kept awake, weren't they? Whatever. He was an investigator, not a doctor. Hey, he's breathing, and in 20 minutes... He'll be in the base hospital getting transfusions. He tried not to think of how he'd react if it was Danny bearing those wounds. Of course, Danny wouldn't get himself into a situation like this, he decided, with certainty. Then he remembered what Dan had told him about the Connors, his ardent young face making it impossible to misjudge his opinion. So maybe Danny would lend a hand at blasting Cyberdyne sky high, after all. Thank God the perimeter fence was finally in sight. Ferry came out of the guard shack and hopped into Jordan's car. Then he pointed forward and Dyson took off. What do you think? Dyson asked. The Major turned in his seat and looked at Connor. What the hell do I know? I'd say he's asleep. He shook his head. But for all I know, he's in a terminal coma. Jesus. Jordan breathed. The doc will tell us, Ferry said calmly. Until then, just drive. When they pulled up at the base hospital, the Major went in and got a gurney and some attendants to take the boy out of the car. Inside, he asked for two doctors by name. The second was on duty and was duly paged at the Major's request. When he arrived, Ralph explained that the boy and his injuries were secret Cyberdyne business and that the hospital staff were bound to aid them as a matter of national security. Major, this boy looks to be under 18 by a good few years and he's been shot. We can't keep something like this secret. At the very least, his parents need to be notified. The doctor said reasonably. All I'm allowed to tell you, doctor, Jordan interrupted is that this boy is in danger and must be guarded. I assure you this won't be swept under the rug someplace. But sometimes timing can be more important than strict adherence to the rules. We're not talking rules here, the doctor insisted. We're talking laws. If laws are being broken here, doctor, I will take the responsibility. Jordan said gravely. 
My object is to keep this boy alive. If you take it upon yourself to report his presence here, you may cost him his life, and that will be your sole responsibility. The Major and Dyson stared the doctor down. Reluctantly, he agreed to abide by their conditions. Then he got to work. Jordan blew out his breath in relief and looked at the Major. I didn't think he was going to agree. He said quietly. Oh, he would have, Ralph assured him. He was just trying to make me order him to do it. That way, see, it's totally my responsibility. But he's too good a doctor to let the kid lie there bleeding while he played that game. Ferry grinned. Sometimes having a conscience can be really inconvenient, you know? Jordan's mouth tightened. Unfortunately, yeah. And now, the officer said cheerfully, it's your responsibility. Thanks. Cyberdyne, the present. Serena sat in her darkened office, watching the digital readout projected onto her eyes, count down the seconds, the minutes, the hours. It was 9.15 and 27 seconds. She had sent the doctor and nurse home at nine. It was obvious now that Dyson wasn't going to show up. Serena had been sifting through police reports, looking for arrests or accidents, or even abandoned cars. Nothing. Jordan should have been able to handle him as a trained agent. The other and less palatable possibility was that Connor had subverted Dyson. No, she thought, not possible. Why would he aid and abet the people that he knows killed his beloved brother? Answer, no reason. Still, he was human. Best to keep an open mind. The adult John Connor had a record of inspiring humans to insane actions. She blinked and the time readout stopped. No sense in wasting time. She had work to do, her own and Cyberdyne's. If Dyson showed up, he did. If not, not. She thought that whatever happened, she could still look forward to a visit from Sarah Connor in the near future. Two hours later, a considerable amount of report reading and writing had been accomplished. The phone rang and Serena patched in. Burns, she said crisply. Uh, Miss Burns, this is Joe Cady of Advanced Security, a man said. In the background, she could hear shouting voices, trucks, running feet, a siren. Advanced was the subcontractor she'd hired to watch the automated factory site. The military had wanted to keep a low profile. Advanced, despite the misspelling that made them first in the phone book, had a pretty good record. Things did not sound good right now, however. What's happened, Mr. Cady? Serena asked calmly. S Some people came out of the night. They distracted us with a forest fire a few miles off. At least I think it was them. The fire department guys said they thought the fire was arson. Then they snuck in and got the drop on us. They tied us up and locked us in the guard shack. They took our cell phones and then they set bombs all over the place said they were the Luddite Liberation Army. When we got loose, we sent a guy over to where the fire was to see if he could get us some help. They even blew our cars up, the bastards. So they've been gone a couple of hours, at least. Katie's voice was shaking. Serena gathered from this that he hadn't been sure the Luddites were going to leave them alive. How bad is the damage? She asked. She quickly added, 
I assume no one was hurt. You'd have told me if someone was hurt, wouldn't you? She did, after all, have a role to play here. Yeah, Katie said. I mean, no, nobody's hurt. He paused, and she could hear him sucking his teeth. The destruction is pretty near total, he said. All the machinery, all the construction supplies, and the company's trailer. The area they'd leveled, everything is busted up, burning, or crapped up somehow. I never saw anything like it. Did they leave a message? She asked. They must have left a message. This whole thing is a message, of course. If they did, ma'am, it's gone now. They didn't leave anything with us or tell us to say anything like a message, you know? It's just fire and smoke and mess here. Katie's voice faded away. I'll look around, though. A messenger has left a parcel for the president and CEO. Seven, stationed at the security desk, said. When I told her they weren't here, she said she'd had been instructed to give it to the next most important executive that was present. Serena sent six to retrieve it for her. Probably it was from the LLA, the Luddite Liberation Army of all the stupid names. These jerks couldn't liberate their grandmother from back-breaking peasant labour by buying the old girl a washing machine. But they all had to have liberation in their name. Serena supposed they would feel liberated if everybody else was forced to embrace their ideals. Have you informed anybody else about this? She asked Katie. Barely a second had gone by in real time. Well, Tony brought back some of the firefighter guys, and they radioed the police, of course. He sounded nervous. I, I don't know if that was okay or not, but we needed help, and they were the only people we could contact. The general is not going to like this, Serena thought. But I did warn him to let me handle the security directly if he didn't want the army to take care of it. She shrugged mentally. If the authorities have questions that you can't answer, Mr. Cady, you may refer them to me at this number. I'll be here for several hours yet. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Yes, I'll do that. He groveled. Pathetic, the I-950 thought. Good night, then, she said. Oh, um, since there's nothing left there to guard, I guess you and your crew can go home after the police are through with you. Great. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll tell them. Thank you. She broke the connection and leaned her head back against her chair. The I-950 was conflicted. This development was essential if she was to convince Cyberdyne and the military to move the factories far from human habitation. The I-950 had always preferred the idea of having the Army Corps of Engineers construct the facility. It wasn't traditional, but it would be cost-effective and very secret. Maybe now. Serena sighed, almost contentedly. Each crisis gave her a greater margin of control. The fact that she had warned Cyberdyne that this might happen would count in her favour. Except possibly with Tricker. He'd probably wonder about her prescience, her uncanny ability to read the future. If only he knew, she thought with a smile. The problem was that a professional paranoid like Tricker didn't believe in precognition but did believe in people who made things happen. The trick would be controlling this Luddite revolution. But if the sites are remote enough, it shouldn't be a problem. And once the factories were operational, she could direct them to build some advanced weaponry for self-protection. 
It would be good when the first HKs, those dear old reliable hunter killers, rolled off the assembly line. Very good. But for now, she had the problem of her missing assistant, and the equally, and more importantly, missing John Connor. Supernatural, she thought. They're positively supernatural. Two made contact. Now what? Serena muttered. The I-950 clone has been harvested. Two announced. It has survived the implant process. Excellent, she sent. Keep me appraised of its progress. How is the other surrogate doing? Extremely well, two sent. Shall I terminate it? Not yet, Serena ordered. Have you terminated this one's vehicle yet? Not yet. Keep her for the first week, she ordered. The I-950 organism will benefit from the mother's milk. In seven days it should be weaned and you can dispose of the human then. Understood. Is there anything else? she asked. Nothing. Out, Serena sent. Out. Two confirmed. Serena sat, thinking. It had been quite an evening. Good, bad, and indifferent. Still, for the most part, her plans were moving along just as they should. If only she knew what had happened to John Connor. Fort Laurel Base Hospital, the present. Jordan sat in the too small, too short, and too hard plastic chair in the hospital waiting room and stared at the mayonnaise-coloured walls as he thought. How did this happen? How did I allow myself to be talked into this? He was feeling more than a little stunned. This was him? He was here, really? Jordan sighed. At least Teresa and Danny will be happy. Ferry returned and handed him a cup of coffee from the machine down the hall. I got a flush, you got bupkis, the Major said, handing over the card-decorated cup. Gee, thanks, Jordan said with a grin. They sat quietly drinking the lukewarm brew. You are so gonna get your ass fired, Ferry said after a few minutes. Yeah, I am, Dyson agreed with a sage nod. Yup, you got it in one. The Major looked at him out of the corner of his eye. You don't sound too upset, he observed. I think I'm too stunned to be upset right now, Jordan said. He waved a hand. This is the craziest thing I have ever done. I just can't believe I'm sitting here. So, what I'm wondering, Ferry said, is where the hell you're going with this thing? He waved vaguely. I mean, this kid should be turned over to the police, you know? Jordan nodded and took another sip. Then he shrugged. Eventually, yeah. See, the thing is, I agree with Miss Burns that Sarah Connor is headed our way. I think that having John on hand might... He tipped his hand from side to side, wincing. Make her a little less violent. That sucks, Ferry observed. Yeah, it does. Jordan agreed. I keep thinking of my nephew. The doctor came towards them, and both men stood. He's going to be fine, he said. I've given him something for the pain, and he'll sleep through until morning at the least, and probably most of tomorrow. 
The concussion? Jordan asked. The doctor's eyes moved from the major to Dyson. I wasn't sure you cared, he said. Jordan gave him a disgusted look. So? You're right, the boy does have a concussion. The doctor conceded. A very minor one. I don't anticipate any problems, but I've got the nurses checking in on him every hour. Good, Jordan said. Uh, I'd also like to keep an eye on him myself, so would it be possible for me to bunk in with him? The doctor held his clipboard in front of him like a shield. Hospital beds are for hospital patients. You can set up some kind of a cot, the Major said pleasantly. Or maybe a reclining chair or something. We have to cooperate with Mr Dyson on this. It's for the boy's own good. The doctor opened his mouth to protest, saw the steel behind Ferry's smile, and relented. Very well, he said stiffly. I'll have the nurses set something up for you. Good night, gentlemen. I don't think he likes you, Ferry observed quietly, watching the doctor walk away. Jordan shrugged. I'm not sure I like me very much right now either. He grimaced, then turned to his friend. Thanks, Ralph. You've gone way above and beyond on this one. I owe you. I know, Ferry said with a grin. And one dark night, I might just collect on it. He slapped Dyson on the shoulder. But you've already made a partial payment by giving me a heads up on this Sarah Connor thing. The doyen of Cyberdyne security hasn't seen fit to let us grunts in on what's going on. If we're not on our toes for this, it's my fault, not yours. He gave Jordan another pat on the back. Night. Jordan watched him walk away, then turned and headed for the nurse's station. I am so going to get my ass fired, he thought. New York City, the present. Ron LeBane studied the pictures on his computer screen in awe. <laughs> they did it, he thought gleefully. They actually did it. Put a thumb in the eye of the military industrial complex, kicked the legs right out from underneath the bastards. And they had the balls to film it as they did it. He didn't even need to be concerned that this would lead the police to him because they'd flooded the net with these images. Ron wasn't as happy about the forest fire they'd started and was prepared to be angry until he got a separate message to the effect that the area was already scheduled for a controlled burn. Very impressive, very satisfying. The only difficulty, he thought, will be in controlling them. It wouldn't be the first time that early success had also led to early imprisonment. And I have plans for these people. <laughs>